Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, City of York Council Health and Adult Social Care Policy and Scrutiny Committee. It's uh, Tuesday, the 21st of February. Um, we already have um, a number of guests seated on the table. I'll introduce them shortly. We have apologies from, from Councillor Heaton, who um, has had some... for the time that he spent on um, health scrutiny um, last year or two. Um, he indicated that he's, he won't be standing in, in the local elections, so he, he, he won't obviously be attending any further health scrutiny meetings and he wanted to pass his on his thanks. And um, we don't have any other um, apologies. Um, declarations of interest, any members have any declarations, please? Councillor Bassi. Yes, thank you, Chair. I just want to declare that my father is a client of the Council's Be Independent service that's mentioned in paragraph 12 of item 5. Thank you. Anyone thank else? You. No. Thank you very much. Um, the minutes of the last meeting uh, from the 14th of December, uh, pages 1 to 6, are members content that they're an accurate record of the meeting? I just one question, if I might, Chair. I was just yep. wondering, uh, yes, they are an accurate record. I was just wondering if there was any update to the uh, resolutions that we had on page four. And uh, if the uh, recommendation we put that the City of York Council and Health and Wellbeing Board encourage general, general practice providers across York to engage in non-prejudicial sharing of data, um, if there'd been any action on that. Uh, would you know Sharon, whether the latest is on that? Yes, so um, we're very fortunate in uh, York that we have um, a population health hub um, that is comprised of um, business in, it's headed up by Peter Roderick, who reports to me, um, it has um, representatives on it from um, all of our partners, um, including primary care. Um, and so through that vehicle, uh, we are looking at how we can share data more effectively on a whole range of issues, but be that dementia or uh, a range of, of other issues. So um, yes, I could say that is being taken forward. Thank you, Sharon. I think everyone can attempt with everything else in there. Thank you. So I'll, I'll sign the minutes in that meeting. Thank you. Um, we don't have anyone registered in public participation uh, to speak this evening, so we can move on straight to the first of the agenda items, item uh, number four, um, the local plan of action for drugs and alcohol in York, uh, pages seven to 12. We have a, a number of um, guests around the table that uh, have joined us, um, not necessarily to speak on, but they may be they may wish to answer questions or help uh, assist answer questions. So we have uh, Peter Roderick, the consultant in public health, Ruth Hine, the public health specialist practitioner, Maxine Squire, the assistant director of education and skills, um, David Barth and Andy Simpson from North Yorkshire Police, good evening, gentlemen, and uh, Sharon Stoltz, of course, our director public health. Um, Peter, are you introducing this one? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, real thanks to some colleagues uh, who are with me too, and I think it's actually a really good uh, display of the partnership working that we've got uh, around the drugs and alcohol agenda uh, to have um, my colleagues with me today. And just to introduce the paper, really, and we do have a presentation that goes alongside it, um, the uh, government had published a national drug strategy uh, back at the very end of 2021, which had some significant um, resources given to local areas as part of it, but also significant um, asks and requirements of local areas. Um, the first of which, which we got going with early last year, was to set up a drugs and alcohol partnership, um, which uh, has uh, a senior responsible officer reported, which is uh, our Director of Public Health, Sharon, and has a large number of people represented on it. Um, 
reflecting the fact that drugs and alcohol and the issues generated by them, I think, really do cross over into lots of different areas of policy, lots of different areas of our city's life. Um, we have been working uh, since then on a number of things, not least looking at the resource that has been given through the uh, drug treatment grant uh, and where that should be best placed. Um, but also the, the piece of work that we want to share with members today for comment uh, and for collaboration really um, on as it uh, as it formed, which is our local plan of action. Uh, we're asked to uh, start off by doing a needs assessment of what the need is and then to write a local plan and though I'm focusing mainly on the plan today we've also got a slide which shows some of the needs assessment work that we've done for members uh, information and, and to show that we're, we're basing what we're doing on good evidence um, and this uh, I would say right from the start is a live and evolving plan it's a plan of action um, it's not a, a big glossy strategy that has lots of sort of introductory material in setting the scene I think we know what the scene is and we have the national strategy but we want to have some actions that sit under it locally that we lead on and that's what you're being shown today um, but the actions are, are well we're adding to them every week really um, in terms of what we want to do together so there'll be things missing that we will incorporate um, also it's a 10-year strategy from the government so we're not trying to bite off uh, too much at the start and a proceeding slightly stepwise in it so the paper lays out some of that context that I've given um, and uh, I'm going to use the presentation really to work through some of the key features and bring a couple of my colleagues in as we go and hopefully um, pressing a button will move this along there we go um so we, we start off uh, as uh, as we really need to uh, with the data and understanding drugs and alcohol in york and the scale of the challenge um, there is a lot more that sits behind this this is an area actually that is particularly rich in data uh, um, but but i've just tried to on this slide pull out a few of the key things i think we need to be aware of um so uh, we have in York, um, uh, sort of around about 400 or so, uh, it, it, the numbers go up and down, obviously, um, uh, users uh, of uh, drugs who are in treatment in our drug and alcohol provider, which is changing lives. But that's probably only half the estimated number of opiate or crack users, the main areas of drugs that we see in treatment. Um, so we think we're probably seeing about half the population of uh, people who are using drugs through a treatment uh, pathway and half who aren't. We know that there are some uh, substances, particularly benzos, benzodiazepines and alcohol, where our use is higher than others within treatment. That doesn't necessarily mean it's higher in the city, but it means we're treating those people more. Um, and we know when it comes to alcohol, um, of, of whom we see again, a sort of another four or 500 every year in treatment, that actually that's probably less than one in five of those who have an alcohol issue, which you would call dependent and could be amenable to treatment. So um, there is um, within our, our, our drug using population, probably about half getting treatment, um, but less than one in five of our um, uh, population who do have alcohol dependency. Um, we know that um, uh, actually our population drinking above low risk levels, that's the graph on the far right, even though it looks like quite a big gap, we're, we're pretty much level pegging with England on that. Um, so it's not necessarily that our low risk population uh, of alcohol users uh, is the thing we need to be concerned about, although we're still there talking about more than one in five of the population who are drinking above the recommended level. But we know our high risk population is something we're very concerned about and are not necessarily always accessing the treatment. Treatment. We do know that our alcohol specific admissions to hospital, so these are people from York, resident in York, because this is GP data, people who are resident in York who are admitted to hospital with a condition which is relevant to alcohol use. Um, we know that is higher than the national average and has been for some time. It has, however, been coming down over the last couple of years in line with national averages and particularly during COVID um, that reduced. Um, we have about sort of 450 odd new presentations to treatment. I think that's the most recent year we have data on. So that number again does fluctuate. And if we think about the number of adults in treatment, um, we know that there are probably um, around 506 adults in treatment at any one time who have uh, children. So actually, obviously, some adults have more than one. So we're probably looking at sort of 800 odd 
uh, children whose lives are affected by drug and alcohol issues, uh, which is um, obviously something we know can lead to um, adverse experience, adverse consequences as children move through up into adulthood. Uh, and we know that the, the number is lower, but we have a, a proportion of opiate dependent adults um, who have children too, uh, and children who are growing up in homes where drug use is present. And that obviously does then feed up into um, what we see through social care and some um, children's in needs assessment data there, just in terms of the number of children who um, are affected by these kind of issues. Um, promise I'll move through future slides a bit quicker than that, but that had quite a lot of data on. Um, takes a bit of time to move through. Thank you, Richard. So our strategy on a page takes its cue from the government's uh, sort of uh, pillars of the strategy. And, and those are these three, breaking drug supply chains, delivering a world-class treatment and recovery system, and reducing the demand for recreational drugs. So you, members will immediately see that the middle one of those is very much about services public health commission to treat uh, and prevent and help through recovery initiatives, those who have existing issues, but uh, work on drug supply chains, um, recreational drugs use, um, is very much a partnership issue, a significant criminal justice element to it. Um, the, the strategy asks us to do a number of things. It asks us to prevent uh, more drug-related deaths. Uh, it asks us to um, see more people in treatment, see more people through residential rehabilitation. Um, it, it asks us nationally to close more county lines uh, as a uh, significant element of the drug supply chain. So there are a number of things we're asked to contribute to, although for none of those are we given a York specific target that we have to meet, but those are national aspirations. Uh, this is um, essentially the overview of our action plan. So as you can see, those three headings, and I'm not going to dwell on this because we have pages for each of these, but hopefully members will be able to see and, and within this plan, we're, we're both asking how will we do it? So we're, we're looking at some key action areas, but also how we know it's worked. And essentially in that bottom box, you have metrics or indicators that we collect quite regularly, um, some of which the government are asking us to collect, but actually are, are quite hard to, to, to pull together and are not from nationally sort of produced data that we have to try and understand how we bring in locally. Um, but but there are some quite well established ways of measuring the effectiveness of drug treatment services. Obviously, a statistic like a drug related death or a drug related emission is obviously measurable. So there are a number of things there which we can measure. Um, uh, but we're going to go through the three pillars um, quickly, um, and I'm going to hand over to my police colleagues uh, to comment on this first one uh, around breaking drug supply chains. Yeah, thank you. Um, just in relation to the slide, I think what, what's important um, to highlight with this is for that police element um, where we, we seek or we look to pursue criminals and offenders. Um, it's, it's very much a gateway of um, support also for those that are, are vulnerable to those that are a victim of um, these supply chains, and that's either those that are vulnerable as a result of their dependencies on the commodity that's being traded, or those that are vulnerable because they're being targeted by organised criminal elements that are supporting the facilitation of these drug lines. And with that police inter interaction, we're, we're able to offer that gateway through to appropriate services to cradle and support those individuals that are at risk. So it's not the old police adage of chasing the baddie and putting them in prison. It's that other supportive work that is very much part of North Yorkshire and, and York's police service to protect those um, who are, are vulnerable and are at risk of these supply chains. Um, so I just, I just wanted to make that clear from the off. Um, if I can go through the key actions from top, top to bottom really and just give a a flavour and understanding of what that means to us as a police service in the community of, of York. Um, if there are any questions, I suppose, are we free to field them now or a, a, later, a later time? You'll have to forgive me, it's my first uh, 
I may be showing my naivety in this. No, that's fine. We, we normally go through presentation first, and okay. then. Uh, but I mean, if there's something that members think the urge need to pick up on, they'll indicate to me yeah, anyway. Fine. So okay. we might. So when we look at action one, the middle market tier is when we look at the orchestration and the um, involvement of that ability to organise and benefit from criminal activity. Uh, the middle market tier is all important to us. Where we target those at street level, it's it's more a um, sort of a residual, if you like, um, action as a result of that um, supply chain. Where we may have those that are running for those that are really benefiting from the supply chain. Um, the middle market tier offers offers us the ability to target those um, that are involved in the organization and the facilitation of the supply of um, a given commodity within any one area um, and that deliberate actionable information that we seek i think in police speak would probably refer to it as intelligence um, comes from a variety of different um, areas um, and we'd seek that information from our communities from ourselves as a police service our staff and officers but very much our partners as well and the information that they can provide us there to be effective and efficient and in, and in, in that being legitimate as a police service in being able to deliberately focus um, specific resources at particular targets. So in a, in a broader sense, if we don't know and we look at providing a police response in a given area, um, we can um, suffer uh, poor um, marketing of our own organisation, really. Um, we, we go in as a, with a broad brush, target communities broadly. Um, we, can do, we can be seen as a police service to be doing the wrong thing. What's important with the information that we are able to glean that is specific it enables us to go straight to the door of the individual that's of importance to us. So the, the individual that is, is organising or running that crime um, interest uh, with limited resources. So we've been as efficient as we can in that, in that area. Um, if I go into section two, that financial um, element, again, when we're looking at supply chains, uh, where we haven't previously our uh, economic crime unit within um, within our police service um, has specific a specific task in there to look at all of our uh, organised crime groups and our serious and organised crime risk to identify anomalies to approach around um, the the pursuit of um, financial. Uh, action that can see us take that finance away from the, the criminal elements that are at play. So people are only involved in crime in order to make money in the main organised crime. And, and the one way of dismantling and disrupting that is to identify where those pots of money or that capital, that criminal capital is held and taking it from the individuals. So we, we played a, a deliberate part there with our economic crime unit and targeting, it, targeting those who are um, organising the the, um, the, the crime and the, the supply chains um, to take that, um, take that capital away from them, if you like. Um, action three, uh, we look at county line flagging and offender management in order to break the supply chains and certainly reduce county lines. We first need to identify them, identify those offenders and identify those individuals who are, who are, who are at risk. And in order that ourselves and partners, and more broadly as an organisation, we're able to uh, persistently acknowledge those individuals that are causing us the issues or are needing that partnership support and that, um, that partnership intervention, uh, it's important that we raise those individuals as we come across them. Um, part of our um, approach and management of organised crime, um, which are drug supply chains in the main are, we have, there's a national process around our identification, um, scoring of risk and involvement of individuals within 
a particular organized crime group. Uh, it's our deliberate approach to identify them as a police service, the makeup of those groups, the principal periphery members, understand how they work, their modus operandi, um, who's involved in what action, what role they take within that level of organized criminality, and then target them appropriately. Um, equally with that, we help support an understanding of who are left vulnerable as a result of that criminal action, and we support them equally in partnership and sharing of that information with, with our partners. Um, action four, that police and partner information development, um, again, looks at the that precision tasking of our resources and partnership resources. So being efficient and effective in what we do supports that legitimacy, as we, men we mentioned. Um, but in our various partnership panels, um, and SOC meetings, we have a forum where information can appropriately be shared between partners, uh, statutory partners, uh, and that helps support our approach to combating serious and organised crime and the drug supply chains that, that come from that. Uh, within that, we, if we move on to action five, we, we involve and incorporate uh, the police and probation service in the sharing, that inf sharing of that information up to a point where we're able to manage individuals under civil and ancillary injunctions. And even if they don't meet that threshold, so when we talk about serious crime prevention orders as a result of uh, an individual being found guilty of a serious and organized crime offense, we may also be able to identify those others that we feel are at risk and offer through referral to appropriate partners, intervention strategies to prevent them from getting involved in serious and organized crime. Uh, we're all also able to identify those that fall short of civil orders that may be released back into our communities that have historically been involved in drug supply chains or serious and organized crime in some form that we can intervene on their release from, um, from the prison service. So, um, again, with partners, we, we play a big part in understanding that broader picture uh, in order to, to combat um, this area of our priority. Thanks very much, Andy. I'm going to move on to my colleague, Ruth, who I think is going to cover these two areas. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, as part of the partnership um, that Peter described um, and the funding that came, we were required to complete a three year overview of how we were going to meet the, the needs and the requirements attached to the funding. The actions were stipulated by um, National as to where the areas we needed to work on and how we were going to do it. So. Looking at these, we have the increased treatment and harm reduction capacity, the treatment quality, which is a real key thing, certainly in improving quality and expanding developing the workforce. But again, looking at that drug related deaths and improving access to mental and physical health care. Um, and then finally, looking at the peer based recovery support service, which is, is also really key. So we've, we've laid out as part of the partnership the three years of how we were going to look at it and certainly the year one that we're currently in now was around building up that information and the data to kind of help give us um, where we need to get to for that final year. So as we've already mentioned we, we've carried out the JSNA um, and, and really very much looking at a review of what we've got here in York at the moment, how it's working and how best we can to move it forward. So the next slide goes into more detail for what we've actually started to work on for, <clears throat> for this current year. So again, um, the areas were then broken down from national as to, to how we needed to focus our um, funding and what we were going to look at. So the overarching one at the top was really to look at the coordination and commissioning within local authorities. Um, and so to be able to start all of this process, you needed that coordination. So we got the development of the partnership board, which is, was established last May, um, looking at the JSNA and then also having a post to help coordinate that. 
We've um, looked at enhanced harm reduction. So one thing that we're um, really keen to focus on, um, which will also go over into year two, is peer-to-peer -peer naloxone training and supply. Naloxone is the um, drug that can be given to somebody who appears to be having an opiate um, overdose and can reverse the effects very quickly and prevent death very effectively if used in good time. Um, so that's something that's starting to be rolled out um, March and it's been led through um, York Drug and Alcohol Service or WIDAS. Um, increasing treatment capacity. So one of the things we're really aware of um, within the service is that caseloads are high um, and for them to ensure that they're delivering good quality that, um, that they needed to increase the um, capacity and workforce there. So there's out vacancy at the moment for a new post to come in. But as part of that, looking at the second one was to identify key workers to look in the criminal justice um, links as, as would the big crossover with criminal justice. So working with the probation service, particularly around ensuring there's a continuity of care between prison release and into the community. Um, so they're all in post and that's working very efficiently. A part of that, there's um, families of those um, who are serving the sentences. Um, there are ADFAM, which is an organisation, national organisation that provides support to families. So a number of family members are, have accessed that support and care. One of the other big areas for us to look at in York was around the residential rehabilitation, um, particularly because um, we have a good community office offer here in York. We have Oak Trees, which is the sort of day rehab, some people might refer to it as, where people go for 12 weeks. Um, we haven't necessarily sent um, individuals away to residential rehabilitation or people haven't chosen to go. However, we're aware that there's probably um, a need there that we're not aware of. So we're looking to do more to really strengthen that pathway to ensure those that may benefit from a residential rehabilitation offer um, can access. And that's um, very much in the process now and, and is being utilized. Um, moving on. So again, <clears throat> looking at that integrated um, response for physical and mental health issues. Um, so there's a dual diagnosis advocate that sits within mind that's working to help support those with mental health conditions. Um, to ensure that they're accessing and getting um, their needs met. There's um, a real strong link, as many may know, between um, those who are using drugs and alcohol who also have a mental health diagnosed condition. So that was something we're leading. And then the other one that we're working with the um, York Teaching Hospital is around developing an alcohol care team model, which again, hopefully by the end of this financial year um, should be implemented. And we're obviously liaising with our colleagues there to, to ensure that gets off the ground. Um, the recovery support, um, which is key for those once they've um, been through services and treatment, the recovery community is really key to ensure people have the support that they need. Um, and so one of the things we did was to fund community initiatives to enable them to um, create their own network so they may the, for example there's a um, an allotment that people work on together and that's really helping them out in the community but they may need new tools etc so they can access funding to help support some of those initiatives. Um, another area that was identified was any other intervention that we felt that might help to meet it and particularly in York as we've mentioned from the statistics is alcohol harm reduction was something that we really wanted to support. Some of the funding for this actually came out of a different um, grant but um, it's still relevant here so we've uh, been a lot of work around um, identifying brief um, intervention which <clears throat> has been the lower my drinking off which some people may have been aware of that has gone out and we've done a targeted text by GPs this year, which has been really successful and, and drove out the figures up from sort of two or 300 to over 6,000 um, through January. Also rolling out the um, alcohol IBA training to support professionals and volunteers who are having those conversations with residents in various roles to help support individuals that may want to reduce their alcohol intake. 
Um, there's a service changing habits that sits with our current um, providers changing lives and they engage in a eight week program with individuals who are drinking harmful levels but perhaps don't meet the thresholds of um, accessing the actual treatment service um, that we're due to um, evaluate how well that's gone um, it's been running for over a year now and so far has had some really good results from that and then the final one is around that um, competency and size of the workforce. This is a, a, a national thing as well, where recruitment con continues to be a problem and is probably one of the largest problems of recruiting. So it's actually being tackled at a regional um, area to, to help use all of our kind of resources more successfully and, and there is a York and North Yorkshire workforce development group that's been established which then links into our regional Yorkshire one to help um, how we're going to manage to recruit further into this. Um, also though from the funding is we're just ensuring that all those staff currently employed at, at YDAS um, can access accredited training um, and I think that then brings us on to our final area, which is around that change in the gener um, generational shift, which, which I suppose is one of the slightly harder ones um, for us to, from a partnership, but there's, there's many things that we're trying to work on with our partners, um, particularly it's the schools. So some of the things we're working on is increased engagement with the York Drug and Alcohol Service in schools and they at the moment have a named link for all secondary schools in York so each secondary school in York will know who they can contact within the service um, and they can go and either do one-to-one -one type of referrals but equally will also help and support with PSHE within the classroom. Um, there is some curriculum work um, being carried out and Healthy Schools Framework is currently being commissioned through our public health team um, a year ago, a survey was carried out in all schools as well um, across a number of health um, issues that uh, to see as a baseline. And that um, has also going to be carried out again next year. But all of the schools that took part and where there were any specific issues, um, work has been done with those to help support them in any identified needs. The affected by services <clears throat> um, at the moment within um, York Drug and Alcohol Service, they currently will support anybody who's affected by. So they're usually children and young people who may have an adult um, who are currently undergoing treatment. It's promoted wide to all partner agencies, um, but they are hoping to do far more engagement with healthcare services, which is probably one of the areas they don't quite um, reach at the moment. And again, ADFAM, as I mentioned earlier, is something that's available to um, adults, family members. Um, and then there was just that final one that links, but actually the um, swift, tough and certain policy, which is a, a government white paper is still going through parliament. And I believe that brings us on to the end, doesn't it? Yeah. So hand back to you. Yeah, and just the last thing to say, Chair, is that the missing words on that slide were demand for drugs uh, in the top. So apologies about that couple of missing words on that, which we can correct. But apart from that, I think we're finished with our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Um, right, we'll go straight to members' questions and please. I'd like to start. Councillor Wells, please. Can I just ask if this report has been shared with other scrutiny committees? I know I'm, I'm thinking um, there was a couple of issues. One was the county lines and things. I know housing and community service, uh, community safety did a topic on county lines and things. And I think that, that they might have benefited from it. And I was also thinking of education as well with regards to um, what was happening in the schools. So I just wondered if it had been shared. It hasn't so far, uh, Councillor, but we can certainly look to do that. That's absolutely no problem. And we can look to see with the, the chairs of the committees and what, what form that can take. But really happy to replay the conversations and absolutely think, this, as we said at the start, this, this cuts across so many different issues, doesn't it, and areas. So we need to make sure we're engaging with everyone. Uh, I mean, Maxine, has this been to, the, I can't speak to the education one, I have to say. No, it hasn't been okay. to uh, children, education and communities.
Thank you, Chair. Well, one thing that struck me when I was reading through it the first time, um, there are a number of references here to uh, hospital admissions being higher maybe than they are elsewhere, to uh, significantly <coughs> higher primary diagnosis of an alcohol condition, et cetera. My first question is, are we talking specifically about York residents here, or are we also talking about what has sometimes been described as the kind of drinks culture of York bringing people in from all around, uh, and presumably some of those ending up in hospital? I'd just like to have a sense of that context. Um, thanks, Kassa. It's a really good question and, and, and it is a complex issue because we have obviously our population, but we have a hospital which serves all the way up York and Scarborough. And then obviously we, we have lots of people visiting uh, the city every year. And th the data on hospital admissions for alcohol um, is, is done in a couple of categories. Um, it's done in a broad and a uh, narrow uh, way. The broad category includes lots of different reasons that you might end up in hospital related to alcohol, where you, you may not turn up with an alcohol issue, but it, for instance, might be a heart attack. And we know that a certain percentage, probably about 10 percent, perhaps, of, uh, of heart attacks are due to alcohol. So they add up all of those individual things. The specific um, uh, admissions are to do with someone really coming to hospital where alcohol is the apparent issue or an, an apparent issue. So those th those are the two measures. But in terms of who they're measuring on it, it I'm really clear on that, that the way the data is generated and the way uh, an admission is attributed is to a patient based on their GP registration. Um, so if you are registered to uh, a GP uh, living in York, um, you will appear in this data set if you're registered to your GP that's outside of a York postcode. So it's both, it goes back to your GP, but then they assign the postcode based on local authority area. So we are talking here about York residents. We're not talking about visitors. Someone comes to Middlesbrough, ends up in a hospital or, or, or London or something like that. They will be coded to their local authority that they live in their postcode. Thank you for that. Can I follow that up, please, Chair? Yes. So... So then what do you uh, think accounts for the significantly higher figures in York, um, if that isn't part of it? And I've asked myself that question quite a lot because it is, it's not necessarily simple. Um, we, we know data like that, there can be a number of reasons. One reason can be that whilst hospital coding um, is, uh, it uses a standard set of codes. It's called ICD-10 and they're used across the world. Um, it, they depend on what the coding teams choose to use it, it, to some extent. Um, and it may be that the trusts are just good at assigning the right code and other trusts around the country aren't so good at doing that. So there, there could be something in the way the data is coded, but it's been quite consistent over a number of years. And and we do notice in other areas, for instance, we have around average alcohol related mortality in the city and we're a fairly healthy city. You'd expect us to have quite low and it's around average. Um, we have um, about the, the sort of the average sort of primary care diagnoses of alcohol dependency and, and people in treatment. So you notice a bit of a trend if you look across all of that, if you look, for instance, in the fact that we're, we've got one of the lowest teetotal populations, and again, that's local authority uh, data, um, fewer people choose to abstain from alcohol um, in York than most other areas in Yorkshire and Humber. So I look at, I think, all of the sort of different bits of what the data is telling us, and the data on the admissions isn't out of step with that. But that doesn't mean 100%. We don't know it's a coding thing. So I think we have to be cautious. And I think we shouldn't overclaim that York has a bigger problem than it has. But it's it's been a trend for six or seven years. It does seem to be backed up in other bits of the alcohol pathway. So I'm confident enough to say that I think we need the types of interventions that we've discussed in the hospital. For instance, if you turn up in your hospital with an alcohol issue, um, you're not always discharged 
um, with a good referral into community services for support. That's one of the things an alcohol care team does. It identifies that someone has the issue. It, it has someone who's got training to come to the bedside or you know, to, to, to speak with them about the issue they have to help them with withdrawal because in hospital you have um, a sense of an enforced withdrawal. You don't have access to something your body may be dependent on. And then you have that need to be discharged into community services. Um, and, and that doesn't always happen optimally. And that is the point of an alcohol care team. And I think even if our data was was lower than average, I'd like our hospital to have that level of care. But given what I see, I think it's it's an important thing that, that we put in place for our hospital. Thank you. So now the, uh, the work of the alcohol care team is important going forward and is part of the strategy for that reason. Thank you. I have other questions, but I think I'll, I'll pass on to someone else. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Barnes. Thanks, Chair. And um, thanks for the report and the presentation. It's been really, really interesting. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've got a couple of questions, if I may. And I'll just start by saying um, I, I does pure coincidence would have it ended up watching a documentary at the weekend about fentanyl use in Vancouver really eye-opening fascinating and I think some of what you've reported here actually chimes with some of what was in that in terms of solutions and evidence bases particularly the peer-to-peer -peer, um, idea uh, so that was really interesting to see um, and I guess my question is about the relationship between kind of the, on the one hand the treatment and prevention services and on the other hand um, the criminal justice measures um, and is, I mean, it's really interesting, the financial section in, in the report, paragraph 13 on page 11, gives us very clearly the treatment and prevention figure, um, but uh, less transparency, and that's not a criticism, um, but less transparency in terms of the criminal justice uh, financial element. So I, I wonder um, if you could say any more between you about the, the budgetary relationships uh, between the two elements, because I guess what I've taken certainly from that documentary I watched and from some of what you've said today is that the evidence base is overwhelmingly there to show that the kind of treatment and prevention in terms of cost benefit, even on the return to the criminal justice reduced uh, spend is phenomenal. Um, my fear is that under yeah, this government, probably the natural inclination is to lean more to one than the other. I don't know. Correct me. Educate me. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I'll, I'll say one, one thing and then bring other colleagues in who might want to comment and ask the police to comment on the, on the finance bit. I mean, I think that the, the government's approach here has been to set up what they've called the combating drugs unit. It's, it's a combined task force, I think is the official title between Home Office, um, Ministry of Justice, Department of um, Communities Leveling Up and uh, Housing. So there is that, uh, that, that cross departmental working on strategies like this. The, the, the total of 780 million, which was in the strategy, which is new money, um, was uh, uh, very much sort of publicized at the time we know what the local authority figures are because we're giving direct grants but we we know that other pots of money are being given for instance there's national trials of employment and support work for people who have uh, substance issues to help them back into employment which is not coming through us as a local authority there's a DWP route so um, this this paper, particularly because public health, I guess, is a council function, we're able to quantify that for that report. And it may be that my colleagues can, but it may be that actually it's wrapped up in much more of the day to day work of criminal justice agencies. Um, and, and I would say in York, wherever the money comes from, we have a strong partnership and we try to discuss around the table. Where's our resource best placed and how can we? integrate the services. And I think a good example of that on Ruth's slide was the four criminal justice workers. They work in changing lives, but they're very much based working in um, within within custody, within um, the through the door stuff uh, for people being released from prison uh, and with the probation uh, service in order to make sure that people in contact with the criminal justice system get that access to the prevention. Because I absolutely agree that is going to prevent in the future is getting treatment and into recovery for those individuals. I'll bring police colleagues in in terms of anything on the finance uh, sense. 
Thank you for the question, Councillor. I can't help you with the money, um, but just I'd like to. I think it's probably an appropriate time to offer some reassurance in terms of the signposting to treatment. So, without doubt, we clearly have a role in the pursue strand of this. Uh, enforcement is our day business. However, I think what we're trying to do with people that come into custody certainly is, is move away from the the um, the how and the what. So, how this happened, what's happened, more towards the why as well. We, could, we can't escape from the how and the what, but we, we want to start looking at the why. So we, we're um, just scoping some work around working with the third sector of getting people into custody, probably over the Saturday and Sunday mornings, to try and interact with people who find themselves in custody at that point of crisis, to try and signpost them to treatment options with a view, of course, to, to diverting them from, from custody again. So th there is work ongoing, and we're also doing quite a lot of work in the, with, with, around the harm reduction portfolio certainly around the, the DARD process, drugs and alcohol related deaths, and um, the um, drug checking, got to get that right, drug checking, so we can test what's in circulation within an area as well, with a view to how reduction uh, mitigation we can put in place around that. So we, as, as Peter says, we've got a good good working relationship, and I think we, we are taking things beyond what historically you might say we have looked at. Um, just in, in addition to that as well, and I think I mentioned at the beginning of my piece around the, the understanding of the police role, maybe as a pursue and a catch and convict sort of role. Um, now, more and more, and where we are going to be testing individuals that are brought into custody, um, that's coming online um in the short term um where it may not result in a sanction for an individual so they may not go through the criminal justice system but as a result of testing positive for some form of um drug they will be referred through to a support agency um the clear hold build uh, initiative nationally which looks at combating serious and organized crime in our communities very much plays along those lines there is a pursue element but it's very much a community-based, service-based support for communities in order to intervene, protect, divert, um, and support individuals that way. Um, and, and in that, I, I feel, and I've seen in my service, that the successes that that plays out in uh, benefiting communities, preventing individuals from falling into the, um, sort of the criminal justice um, system um, and and benefiting them, so benefiting our criminals, benefiting our communities. Um, that intervention work really is 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 being uh, put forward as a a front to all we do at the moment. I suppose the only other thing to add is that obviously North Yorkshire Police cover North Yorkshire, and and we are concerned. But I have very close relations with my counterpart in North Yorkshire Council, and we have quite a few. So I meet with Dave regularly um, for things because of those crossovers. And there are then other funding pools that come down and we'll discuss and as part of the partnership board, what's the best way to use this money and how can we work best to, you know, might joint fund things as well. So use parts of ours. So there are those conversations that happen both at the partnership board, but equally in various other meetings outside. Um, and we certainly look at the emerging drugs and the data. There's, there are others where we've got other partners. Thank you. Councillor Cullock, please. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> like my colleagues, I really welcome this and it's so good to hear of the degree to which you're working together. I, like Councillor Fassi, was was somewhat shocked um, and picked up um, the, the various points that he was, was making. And he made me wonder whether the information that you have, the data that's available, and you've mentioned in particular hospital admissions data and being able to, to look at that to a certain degree of granularity with, with postcodes and perhaps with other, um, I don't know, um, ages or does that, how does that inform the strategy I'm wondering in particular whether that might point to particular areas of the city or particular age groups within the city or other um, criteria that might be helpful in terms of informing the strategy. And when I ask that question, uh, informing us as, as councillors and the City of York Council in, 
in our engagement and approach. Thanks, Councillor Cut. Yeah, uh, it's actually a piece of work that we're doing right at the moment. So we we haven't completed it, but we have asked our colleagues in the ICB, where, which is uh, I also work for, to look at hospital data. Particularly, you mentioned age, and that's something I'm very interested in. Um, what what are the trends over time in who is being admitted with alcohol and with substance use issues um, from an age perspective. Um, there may be a ward uh, or, or sort of even smaller than that, a small area um, aspect to that too. So we're looking into that, but particularly looking to see the trends. Uh, I'm sort of interested in the trends in children and young people um, in particular and uh, the support that is available, the effect of uh, the pandemic, uh, the effect of, you know, we, we know that um, adults uh, who uh, are using alcohol and the overlaps with domestic abuse and that sort of thing, what, what we can pick up from the data in, in some of the trends. So that's, that's, that's work that we're doing as part of the ongoing Joint Strategic Needs Assessment on that. I don't have it right in front of me. We haven't uh, completed it yet. But it's quite a big data set, the hospital data set, but absolutely we're looking into what that can tell us. And particularly, I'm interested in the age breakdown of that. The suspicion, and we, we were given some data about three or four years ago by what was then called Public Health England, um, was that the biggest rise was in those, I think the age band was 55 to 64. So um, that, that was where the, our rise in hospital admissions was mainly driven by. But that was data only correct as of uh, a long time ago, 2019. That's why we're doing this new piece of work to see what's happened, particularly with COVID in between. Just a supplementary, really, to, to what Councillor Cullick was asking. One of the questions I had, um, noting from points 18 and 19 on page 12, um, and given how many times we hear data sharing is an issue across the system, um, I, I find it a little bit strange that the, it's, it's suggesting no IT or legal implications. Is that really, really the case, or is it just... We don't know. Chair, maybe I interpreted that a bit too literally in terms of this report, because you're absolutely right. There are there are definitely IT and property implications of, I mean, for instance, our drug treatment services um, own, well, well, lease properties. Um, so uh, we think about what one area of property is an interesting issue would be how we get uh, liaison workers into primary care facilities in the city where getting a room in a GP surgery is very difficult. So th there are certainly property implications and, and data sharing. Um, yes, although I would say that um, but because we have a central national treatment data system, actually being able to share data um, yeah, th through uh, various channels uh, and people having access to, to that national data is probably better in this area than some other public health or health areas. Um, we also are, I think we're lucky that we are the data controller for um, the drug and alcohol service. So we're able as a, as a commissioner to see their data. Um, but yeah, yeah, for instance, uh, I mean, just getting um, sort of data shared for some of the schemes that we've outlined on on, on the particular people we'd like to um, prioritize for some of the interventions that we're doing is, is, is not easy. And um, looking at the hospital data and then being able to say, well, who does that, who actually is that? Which individuals can we tell primary care about those individuals so that primary care could offer them more care and support? That's that's often impossible to do to 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 do that sort of sharing between a hospital and the GP practice about you know um, a list of patients who might benefit from more care and support. So certainly there are always IG challenges, and we do try and work through them over time, but it often takes quite a while. Thank you, uh, Councillor Vassi. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, another thing that really struck me with this report, one of the many tragic areas of this is the impact on children in households where there are alcohol or opiate dependencies. Um, I've seen such households myself. I've seen the chaos that children are left growing up in, and I'm sure you have far better experience than I have, broader experience. I'm, I'm keen to just get an idea of how this new initiative, this new strategy is going to help us reach across because my suspicion is, you can tell me if I'm wrong, that these, these problems 
tend to go from generation to generation. Um, and I'm wondering what this new strategy is going to do to protect children going forwards um, that we haven't done before. What your hopes are going forwards that we might help to break this cycle that uh, families grow up into. Some of it obviously links to the work that will take place with education, but it's it's ensuring that that's um, not just generic work, but actually very, very targeted and also helping young people to understand what the local context is around this, rather than just presenting them with educational materials, which are um, describing any place. It, it's very important that they understand um, what this issue is like in York, how it could impact on them and their lives in the future, and also their, their um, broader responsibilities as well in terms of being able to break some of this cycle. We're obviously as well, we need to consider those children at the moment that don't regularly attend school. And uh, that is one thing that I think we do need to consider as we're starting to develop this strategy. And, and obviously Peter said this is a piece of work that is, is iterative and it's being developed as we speak. Um, but it is, it's joining together all that information that comes from things like family early help assessments, uh, the, the uh, information that's held within schools where they flagged a concern, where, where they know that this may be uh, something that they're worried about with the context of a, a child and a family. And it's also starting to ask those questions around those children who um, are vulnerable because, as I say, they're, they're not attending school regularly or they are subject to exclusion from school. And, and starting to bring all of that together around um, a, a response that becomes then much more targeted and much more direct. Pick up on something else that the service is looking <clears throat> to develop and, and, and do on a limited, but is to support those families where someone is in treatment. So obviously Maxine's kind of talking about maybe they're not always, but those that are is to look at doing programmes alongside to help the family members support them through it. You know, someone going through that 12 week rehabilitation and then they go home, but no work's necessarily being done with the wider family is really important. That's certainly something that we're looking to. To, to move forward really. Um, and I think the other piece of work that is to look at that wider stigma reducing thing, which I know we've all talked about around, you know, so children, young people and or family members of any age can actually reach out for support without feeling that stigma of saying, you know, my mum, my dad, my aunt, whoever's their carer, they can't tell a teacher because of the worry around that. So there's, there's wide work, but uh, you know, there, this is that long-term, we're hoping to get there, but there are certainly some things that we won't be doing straight away. Can I respond? Thank you. Yeah, but thank you for all of that. Um, part of me wonders, in, in my experience, I've seen that people can struggle to understand a different normal, that children grow up in one context and, and struggle to actually comprehend that what they're living through isn't normal. Um, and, and like Councillor Barnes, I listen to a lot of uh, broadcasts, and I heard a, a broadcast recently on the Mafia, which, in which a judge had organised enabling families to move away from the place they were at and experience a different way of living to then inspire them that there, there were different ways of living. And I'm just intrigued to know whether there's whether you think there's a role in some regard uh, maybe it's already happening to help children and the adults in, in all honesty in these families to see a different normal and and how that plays out it, if i can say as a police service we're we're starting a ball rolling with um, Operation Chill, um, which looks and identifies, um, and again, through experience, those individuals that are involved in uh, particular environments, uh, some relating to crime, who over time we see those younger elements of those families replace older brothers, replace uncles, replace fathers, 
in the same environment as they get older. Um, where as a police service, we clearly recognize and understand where a child is subject to some physical harm. With Operation Chill looks at that vulnerability and that harm that's likely as a result of that criminal environment that they're in. So we would subject to referral through to partners as a result of that acknowledgement of that child being in an environment that has a clear criminal link. So it may be older brothers, uncles, fathers that are involved in um, organised crime or higher level crime, acquisitive crime, drugs lines. And we know without intervention, those children will fall into the set or the, there's a, a likelihood that those children will fall into that same activity in later life. So Operation Chill looks at supporting partners to intervene uh, at an early stage to protect and support and to divert um, as a result of that child's involvement and risk to serious and organised crime. They may not be subject to physical harms. They may not be su subject to other forms of abuse, but because they're in that crime environment, that in turn is a specific risk, which we're promoting now through to referral to partners. Thank you. Um, any further questions, members? I've got a couple myself. Um, point uh, paragraph eight on page 10. Um, one of the, uh, the three key pillars is deliver a world-class treatment and recovery system. Um, what do we think that looks like? And how, would you, how far away from it are we, would you say? And um, how will this overriding and critical components of the strategy be scoped? Um, well, well, first of all, our, our drug and alcohol provider aren't here, but uh, your drug and alcohol service uh, is a really high quality service. Um, it's clinical services recently rated outstanding by the CQC. Uh, so we're lucky in York to have the service uh, that is uh, commissioned for public health. Um, which doesn't mean, I mean, the world, words world class are, are interesting, aren't they? And, and I guess uh, how you define that uh, will differ. Um, there's definitely ways that we can support that service, uh, grow its capacity to treat more people because of the unmet need that the data describes. Um, we, we have been worried about the caseloads of each worker. Um, we know that there are quite clear quality standards about how many people an asset coach a, 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 a psychosocial intervention worker should have on their caseload and for a number of years in york it's been a lot higher than the sort of quality guidelines would state because uh the service um hasn't been able to um uh hasn't had the resource to be able to manage those caseloads down they have over the last year in part because of the investment that we put in uh dropped quite significantly from sort of around the sort of 70 to 80 per um coach to to around the 40s 50 mark the evidence says it should be about 35 so there's a way to go on that but i think we're, we're getting towards that doesn't mean it's yet world-class treatment uh, and recovery system, um, but I think it is heading in that direction. I would say something I, I would also really, I, I'm proud of, and I'm very little to do with it, to be, to be honest, I'm proud of the people who've built it, is our recovery community in York. Um, and about 10 years ago, um, members of the public health team were instrumental in really seeding York in recovery, which is now a charity uh, with uh, its own recovery workers. Um, very peer led. Um, you can uh, three times a week in York, there will be a recovery cafe in three different locations where people who are uh, in recovery can go to meet with others in a similar situation who've had their experiences. That's on top of the Alcoholics Anonymous, the Narcotics Anonymous, the Gambling Anonymous groups that exist in the city. And it's a real network, probably thousands of individuals who've had addiction experiences have moved into recovery and then form that new network of friends who are in the same place as them and can, back to, to Cancer Vassi's norms, think, can provide a new normal of not using. Uh, and that is, is very evidence-based, um, very little public funding that goes into that. It's mainly peer work. Uh, and it's a great example, I think, of um, 
of, of that real sort of community asset based work that we want to see. So I would say if anything's world class, that probably is. And we're trying to move the, the whole treatment and prevention system to, to, to that stage. Thank you, Peter. Sharon? Just repeat the name of that network. So the, the charity is called York in Recovery, Councillor Cullen. I mean, what I think our colleagues have described is um, a, a really good um, treatment system and uh, broader recovery um, support. I, I will say, though, that that is um, in spite of the funding envelope that is available for these services. Um, so um, colleagues um, may remember that um, we had a national cut to the public health grant. Um, that was over, uh, uh, over a four year period. Um, as a result of that, we had to make um, some very difficult decisions um, around how we would spend the public health grant. And in fact, our substance misuse services saw uh, a, a significant uh, cut to their funding. Um, it's, 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 I think York is an amazing place where partners have come together, the community has come together um, to deliver um, what are really good services, um, despite those funding um, constraints. But what it did mean was that um, uh, the staff were carrying uh, very large caseloads um, and you know, had to manage waiting lists, um, uh, et cetera. What this supplementary um, grant has been uh, has, has allowed us to do is, is fill some of those gaps. So it's it's fantastic that we now have this funding confirmed. Um, we know what the funding is going to be over, over the next two years. But the core public health grant that we use um, uh, to um, commission the, the kind of backbone of, of the service that budget is still challenged. Um, we don't know what our local authority public health grant allocation is yet because the government haven't announced it. Um, we're uh, about to go out to recommission our core uh, public health um, uh, sort of drug treatment uh, system. Um, and you know, we've only been able to uplift uh, that by a tiny amount. So we've not been able to reverse the cuts that we had to make three, four years ago to drug treatment services. So achieving a world-class service is perhaps a bit ambitious with the level of funding that is available. But I would agree with Peter, when you compare our services in York to services in other parts of the country who have a larger budget than we have, um, we do, we, 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 we do pretty well. Um, and as Peter said, the service recently was rated as excellent by the Care Quality Commission. So um, I, I think we have external validation um, of how, how good our services are, but those funding challenges uh, continue. Thank you, uh, Sharon. Um, and I've got to answer, ask this question because I ask it every time we have a, a strategy come to committee and um, this might be slightly different this one so far that there is clearly a lot more partnership working than a lot of the strategies that are presented to us which are more in-house if you like um, but in terms of um, evaluation of what's gone on before what 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 has been done in to evaluate um, in, in regards to you know what worked well and critically what didn't to, to what was be previously being done? I think this is the first time for a while that York has had something you would label a drug and alcohol strategy formally, um, uh, which doesn't mean we've not done, done work in the area or been working strategically, but it hasn't been written down in such a sort of um, structured way. Um, but we measure the effectiveness of the treatment and prevention services very much through a set of really quite sort of standard national measures, one of which might be the proportion of 
uh, people who enter treatment, uh, who leave each quarter and don't return within six months, uh, which is called the representation rate. So something about supporting people into meaningful recovery, not just seeing people keep on coming back in. So there are a number of those metrics which we look at quarterly, we look at with our provider. So on the on the world-class treatment and recovery system bit, um, we absolutely have some good data there, um, which is nationally available actually. So links can be circulated in that. You can find it on the fingertips um, uh, website, which is the Public Health England's uh, data website. Um, and, and on the breaking drug supply chains and achieving generational shift in demand for drugs, the government have actually given us a set of metrics that we can start to measure some of those things on. Um, quite a lot of it comes from the Crime Survey for England and Wales. I think I'm right in that data source. Um, and uh, some from other ONS data sources. So we do have a series of things that we can measure on this and we'll have a, an outcomes framework for this strategy. So we can say, yes, we've done it or no, there's a problem here and no, if we're achieving what we set out to do. Thank you very much. Um, just going, I was just gonna add the one or two of the sort of more initiatives. So for example, the change in habits that it in itself will have a thorough evaluation. So any smaller projects that are carried out, the Lower My Drinking campaign, which was the, you know, the text and the, the app that's been about that again will be evaluated to say, you know, how robust did it work? Has, has it done? Has it met the outcome? So there's sort of each individual initiative will also have its own evaluation as well as the wider metrics. Okay, thank you. Um, any final questions, members, before we move on? No. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for, for joining us. You, you, you're welcome um, to, to stay with us, but appreciate you. You've possibly already had long days um, or indeed have other work to do. So uh, you, you're welcome to, to leave as well. Um, if colleagues that know the building well can help our colleagues from the, from the police to uh, find a suitable way of building, that'd be good. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, just before we move to item five, uh, I know we, we have uh, the attendance of the executive member for health, uh, Councillor Runciman. I, I wonder whether you want to join us at the, the table. Yeah, you're leaving shortly, are you? Right, fine. Yeah, it just even if, from your or ease of you know hearing. I know it's difficult in the in at the back sometimes. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, so we are at item five, the 2022-23 finance and performance quarter three monitor. And um, Terry Rudden, the strategic support manager, and Steve Tate, finance manager, for out social care with us. Uh, gentlemen, um, is it, do you want to give a brief in, introduction? I, I'm guessing members will hopefully have had a chance to, to look through the report, but if you there's anything you want to say in, a, in advance. No, I'm just happy to take any questions on the report. Okay, good, right. Um, open to questions then, members. Councillor Vassi, please. The first one is, is probably just going to reveal that I didn't understand how the totals are uh, calculated but I tried to make sense of the various sections and the figures that were given so in paragraph five we hear uh, minus 833,000 um, paragraph 13 um, plus 3.724 million I, I when I to totaled them all up I, it didn't seem to add up so just to make sure I've understood. So the, the, the heading, for example, between paragraph 12 and 13, that I think I've understood means that an overspend of 3.7 million. Then paragraphs 13, 14 through to 21 are the figures that reach that total. In broadly, that, um, but we just... There things, you could have a balancing figure, other variants of this amount, but what we just tried to do is pull out the big variations to the budget. So we do more detailed workings as, as a, a forecast against every budget line. And that's the right, top okay. figure of the 3.7 million. And then we pull out the things we think are most material uh, for people to know. And there will be other variances in there, but 
yeah, we haven't reported everything. We just want to bring the main stuff to to members and to their attention. That's why it won't add up. Right. Completely. Okay. That's fine. That that helps a lot. I was just wondering what it meant. So there there are other figures, and this is the broad the broad brush. Um, the first comment I'd like to make, uh, I think, or, or question to pose, is several times in this, we're hearing about savings as a result of vacancies and not being able to fill posts. And then we see it contrasted with having to bring in um, agency staff. And I'm wondering what there is that you think we could do in terms of the way we advertise posts that might actually get us more staff and less reliance on agencies and, and whether there are constraints that prevent that from happening in terms of pay grades or, or whether those are decisions that we could be taking that might relieve pressure on vacancies. Steve, I'm happy to answer that as a voice in the sky if you want to. Hi, Chair Schmeler here. I've joined um I've joined remotely and uh, I've just shocked Councillor Runciman. Uh, so I'm so sorry I can't be with you today, but I have joined remotely, but I'm happy to take that that question. I defer to your expertise, Jamela. <clears throat> So, uh, Councillor Vassi, we have done quite a lot of work around uh, reducing some of our agency spend. And I came here um, to scrutiny uh, uh, a few months ago to talk about how we wanted to bring to build strong performing teams. And that means a, a reduction in agency. We have worked quite a lot with our recruitment team on getting the right recruitment and retention package. So we've looked at how we can increase um, training opportunities also uh, the banding in which new social workers who are newly qualified can start but we have started to do additional work with our universities because we've got quite a few universities close by and how we can um, increase one the apprentices from the the college and two um, newly qualified into one of either doing the practice year but equally once they are qualified to to join York. So we've got quite a few systems in place that we are looking to increase our uh, social work cohort. We have been out to advert a few times and, and because some of the roles are very specialist, like an LD in mental health, um, recruitment has not been as successful as we would like it. But most recently, we have been successful in recruiting all our heads of service. So we've got permanent heads of service in place now. We've got a permanent uh, assistant director that will give us good stability at the, that top tier. And as we move down, we know that we've, as, as you all may be aware, it is social work um, week in March. And through March, we've got a series of um, events to support social workers. But equally, we've had social workers who have come forward who are happy to, to talk about their experiences in York. So, Council of Asi, I don't think it's one particular thing. I think it's a number of things that we can do. But having that senior team in place and um, I think all but the principal social worker uh, have, have joined now um, will really support that recruitment. I'll just add one thing. I think one of the other things, the important posts that we filled is the head of commissioning, all age commissioning. So, as you'll see through the report, we've not been able to... Um, get the price we want in the market for some of the care that we need. And there has been that void in that head of commissioning role and that person is in place and that team is now a lot more robust than it has been throughout the year. I think that'll be key to helping us achieve our budget in the in future. Thank you. So that it sounds like some progress is being made is what we're hearing. So the, the other question I had from reading this and then I'll, I'll pass on to someone else was that I noticed in several paragraphs there seem to be reference to organizations not selling as much as they used to in the past, not achieving sales. So for example, York Craft uh, was, had an underachievement of income. Um, be Independent uh, was not expecting further equipment sales. And I'm wondering if there are uh, commercial challenges faced by these particular organizations that we might help with 
uh, and, and whether that's actually, whether I'm understanding that correctly or not. I'll take that one, Chair, because I've got to go in a minute, so I'd like to say something before I go. I had a very interesting visit to your craft. I saw their business plan, but they are caught um, because of the effects of COVID. Um, they could take on more contracts. To take on more contracts, they've got to have more staff. And these are staff with um, particular difficulties, learning difficulties usually, as you know. So do they take the staff on and then hope to get the contracts or do they take the contracts on and then hope to get the staff? And um, the manager there said to me, it's gonna take a while to sort this out. I'm very keen and Jamela knows I am to keep your craft open and to make the throughput greater and to try and ensure that the income and the expenditure balance far more than they do at the moment. Um, but it's, it's not a, a job that they can do in five minutes. However, when I was there, they were all very industrious. Uh, they all talked to me. It was, it was a pleasure to talk to them. And I left feeling that um, the staff and the manager there were on the right track for getting your craft where we think it ought to be. And with that, I'm going to have to go. <laughs> Thank you very much for letting me speak, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Huntsman. Just in terms of the being dependent bit, that 49,000, the council would have been acting outside of its um, powers. So being dependent was sent out as a, a, I forget the term, a community interest company. And then we brought it back in because it wasn't succeeding. Part of their business plan when they were outside of the council was to purchase equipment and just sell it on at a profit. The council is unable to do that within the, the form that being dependent sits within the council at the minute. And so that's why that 49,000 was no longer achievable. Right, so just to make sure I've understood that correctly then. So the council is now working with Be Independent in a different way, having absorbed it back into the council. And, and there are uh, there is equipment that the council cannot sell because of operational challenges or whatever, or procedures is there going to be some process to try and recover some of the value of that uh, in the in the course of the year because it's a considerable sum yes yeah, so i think there's there is work to do on be dependent the original idea was to get it in and stabilize the organization again that's another another team that's had several changes in managers now that feels to be stabilized a bit of a person who's been there a while and um, i think it's something that we do need to look at and see how it is operating Definitely. It should be a key part of our preventative offer to people in terms of keeping them out of care. So I think there's probably a word to do on that, that service. Thank you. And just to close, because I started off by declaring an interest. Um, my father is one of presumably thousands of people across the city who have the advantage of this system. And I can honestly say it's a godsend to know that he can live an independent life and have a system that is able to monitor that he is okay. And I'm sure there must be thousands of families across the city who benefit from that. And I think it's a very important uh, service that is being offered. Thank you. Councillor Barnes, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, referring to the table on page 18, some of the performance indicators, um, and in, in particular, one of them that caught my eye, which is described as neutral in terms of sort of direction of travel, but the um, uh, adult safeguarding uh, data toward the bottom, um, SGA, DO2, DO1, um, big, you know, notable kind of upticks in in both you know, report, uh, concerns reported and also pieces of work completed, which it's that classic thing, isn't it? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I can see why it's put as neutral because you know, actually more work is being done, but clearly there's a trend there. Well, no, it's a single data point, isn't it? It's not a trend, but an uptick. Um, what do we think is sort of going on there? Yeah, any obvious explanation? Um, I, I've spoken to the safeguarding team about that particular figure, and as you say, Councillor Barnes, it can be interpreted either way. It can be people are more likely to report things, or it's more likely to be there is a genuine rise in safeguarding issues. The, the safeguarding manager told me that the reason they think that it's rising 
is because people are contacting it as a kind of last resort measure. So they're thinking of kind of possibly jumping the queue to get adult social care through the front door. So they're coming to the safeguarding team as a backdoor way of getting the service. And that's part of the issue. It could also be that the cost of living crisis is contributing to that as well, because there are more people likely to be in need of support, which we're seeing at the front door as well. So that might be a reason why. Um, just supplementary, if I may, Chair. Um, it, obviously, as a, a single sort of quarter data point, I, I guess it's something that obviously you're, you're attentive to and you'll be keeping an eye on in terms of emerging trends. But, um, you, you know, clearly if, if that additional 25, 30% of, of work is being done, that will have an effect on caseloads and so on. Kind of back to the issue we were talking about previously, wouldn't it? So are we in a position to sort of respond to that accordingly? And, and I guess you're never going to keep caseload consistent with that bigger an uptick. But, uh, uh, you know, if that trend continues into Q4 and beyond, how well placed are the team to sort of deal with that on a sustained basis? I'm not really in a position to comment on the resourcing, but for that particular want, team, but the safeguarding team did say that they are busier than ever. Jamail, if you want to. Want, yeah, I was going to say, do you want me to comment to that? I think because there's two elements, uh, two elements of this um, council, I think one is that we have and we encourage uh, an in increase. So, you know, even if you look at some of our regional uh, neighbours, some of our reporting on our what we call our low level. So beneath a section 42 referrals we are encouraging those to come through so post-covid we're quite conscious so working with Sharon we're quite conscious that there may be some what we call low level safeguarding so there's lots of little bits of um evidence that might actually then result in a safeguard but we'd rather uh, make sure that we actually have them before a section uh, uh, 42 and this requires a different type of, uh, of support. So not necessarily a social worker, but a social care worker could have a look at those referrals and make a judgment of how we take them forward. So within the safeguarding team already, we do have a mixture of, of workforce of social workers who are dedicated to the section 42. So that's the safeguarding work and a dedicated resource around um at safeguarding but equally like as uh, steve was saying we've got a much more robust commissioning team now that would help and support those lower level safeguarding around contracting and commissioning and making sure that providers uh, like care homes and dom care agencies are supported in a different way through a contract management approach rather or landing on on safeguarding as it did before so there's the, we are looking at a cross uh, directorate approach to supporting that team as well More questions, members. Um, paragraphs 39 and 40 on page 20. Um, um, and given the fall and levels of satisfaction residents have with uh, some of the services the council is providing, the summary seems um, somewhat dismissive of uh, the worrying feedback on council services. What action is the council planning to take um, to? me to uh, deal with this so yeah we are we we're always concerned when um our customers are not as satisfied with their, our our services so we have we're doing it two two ways uh chair so one we have actually done a, a staff uh uh a customer survey which uh, Terry uh, Rudden and his team led on so we we actually do know where those pockets of dissatisfaction are we actually equally understand that a lot of our um, individuals who receive a direct payment uh, are, are are mostly dissatisfied of how they can use their monies, and we're having uh, a real focus on direct payments. We're equally linking in with um, our Health Watch col uh, colleagues to to just do a sample testing on some of the cases to make sure that the assessment, the care planning, the joint decision making, and then the outcomes of what services we provide are done and supported with um, the people, with the carers and the people using our services. So we want to know, one, have we got that approach right at the very beginning? Is it the outcome of the assessment that has resulted in their dissatisfied, dissatisfaction of the service or is it the service themselves? And we're just doing that piece of work now, um, Chair, and I'm happy to bring that report back maybe in the summertime of what we found. One, the customer responses and two, what we've done. We are looking, as you know, um, 
towards an inspection by CQC over the next year. So uh, from April onwards, CQC will be in inspecting all local authorities. And one of the areas that they are looking closely at is the I statement. So from individuals talking about, you know, I would like or I would need to have this service and what we as a local authority are doing. So again, we're working with Healthwatch to say, are we actually um, meeting the needs of our individuals appropriately? And from some of the survey that we got back, there are some elements that we really need to focus on. Okay, thank you. Um, in relation to a couple of service areas, so paragraph 66 on page 25, um, which relates to sexual health services, uh, there doesn't actually seem to be any data of access to sexual health services, say incident rates of STI or satisfaction rates. Uh, this seems to be a, an omission. Um, have you got anything to say in connection with, with that? Yes, we, we do have that data. So um, this is a contract that um, the public health team holds with uh, your sexual health service. Um, so that data is available through um, uh, the KPIs uh, we have through monitoring the contract. Um, it isn't in the report, um, but if members would like to see that, we can certainly work with um, Terry and his team to make sure that that data is included in, in future reports, Chair. Thanks very much, Sharon. And then... Um... Paragraph 72 on page 26, um, there were some interventions to reduce smoking in pregnancy, um, but it would appear smoking rates increased actually. Um, do we know why this might be the case? Has there been any analysis? Yeah, so all of our data has really been skewed by the pandemic. Um, and so there are um, some um, oddities, shall I say, I'm sure T Terry has a technical term, but if I can use the term oddities in, 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 in some of the data that we're still working through um, in, 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 in terms of the pandemic. I think the key uh, message here, though, is the variation across wards. So we have some um, wards in York where there are no pregnant smokers at all. And in, there are other wards where that figure can be as high as 16%. So um, we have been working not just in York, but across um, uh, York and Scarborough, because um, the trust, as, as you know, covers that population. Uh, we have with North Yorkshire Public Health Team um, been looking at this. We've put some additional investment in. Um, there's a smoking in pregnancy midwife now uh, that, that, that supports women. We've also had a pilot incentive scheme um, in place uh, to try and uh, encourage um, uh, pregnant smokers to, to, to quit. This is a concern. Obviously, we're not just concerned about the impact of um, tobacco and nicotine, particularly on the pregnant woman, but we're also concerned about the impacts on her unborn child. Um, so this is um, a really high priority for us. Um, I would like that figure to be 0% across the whole of the uh, uh, across the whole of the city. Um, but obviously, there's ongoing work um, around that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Vassy. Thank you. In a sense, it follows on from what you've just said there, Sharon. I, broadly speaking, the Healthy Child Service paragraphs are good news. There's a lot of good news there for, for York, I think. Um, but at the end, paragraph 65, in a sense, went the same direction as paragraph 72 on breastfeeding. It was very clear there were huge ward differences. Um, is the same focus you've just described on smoking in pregnancy being applied there as well and on, on related things to ensure that right across the board, uh, children, babies and mothers are helped to have better outcomes going forwards? 
So um, uh, again, this is a priority for us. Um, the good news here is that um, we've been successful in getting some money from the Hembra and North Yorkshire ICB um, uh, to do some work uh, around breastfeeding. Um, so we're going to be um, receiving an additional hundred thousand um, pounds worth of funding um, to support this agenda. Um, there are a couple of things we want to do. It is very clear that women are telling us that in the hospital and in the community, they're not necessarily receiving the support that they need. Um, so certainly um, support uh, is an area. There still is sadly quite a lot of stigma around breastfeeding, particularly breastfeeding in public. So um, another one of our aspirations is for York to become a breast friend breastfeeding friendly city. Um, uh, so that will involve um, uh, developing a kind of strategy and delivery plan for that. Um, and then the other area we want to focus on is um, uh, community services in York achieving baby friendly status. Um, so the hospital already has that. This is the UNICEF program. Um, it's a worldwide program which um, has a very strong evidence base around supporting uh, women to take up breastfeeding, but also to breastfeed for longer. Um, we haven't been able to progress that uh, in community service, largely because of a lack of funding. Um, but now that we have this funding from the ICB, um, uh, obviously we won't be able to turn this figure around immediately, um, but with the work that we're going to be uh, doing, I would hope that that figure would, would certainly increase. That's good to hear, thank you. Thank you. Um, just one final question for me, and again, it's something I think I've asked pretty much um, yearly in my time as chair. Um, and that's whether the sufficient provision is being made for expenditure because every, every year we come in overspent. And I appreciate there are times where um, the circumstances and unexpected events, but we, we, we seem to get caught out every year quite substantially. So is there a, a problem in the way the department forecasts expenditure, would you say? I think our forecasts are pretty consistent throughout the year. I think where we've struggled, particularly this year, is in delivering the savings and the mitigations needed to achieve the budgets. And that's probably been the case for a couple of years now. So when COVID was around, a lot of the savings were kind of put to one side and covered off by the COVID grant. Uh, so things weren't actioned and they had not been taken forward. And that's happened for a couple of years. So. So the budget has to be set is realistic and it should be set as achievable. So that's that's the principle behind it. And I'm sure you'll be able to debate that in a couple of days' time. Um, I'm pretty confident the way our team forecasts things is whether we're doing enough to direct resource to deliver on the savings and mitigations. To that end, we're, we've already got a meeting set up in a couple of weeks to, to go through the plans on a page to how we're going to deliver the 23, 24 savings if they are approved at Budget Council. And we'll also be looking at the previous year's savings as well to see why they haven't been delivered and what we can do to deliver them to make sure that we come in on a balanced budget next year. Thank you. That, that obviously is critical work. The councillor should be doing every year regardless. Um, but it's good to hear that you, you've got plans to actually do that. Uh, it's imperative, clearly. Any final questions, members? No, right, uh, Sharon. It's, it's not a question, Chair, but before we close this item, um, I just wanted to pick up a data accuracy issue. Um, in paragraph 53 on page 23 in the report, so the final sentence um, in that paragraph says that provisional data suggests that over 90% of clients who set specific health goals have achieved at least one of the goals and over 70% of all the health goals set have been achieved. 
I just wanted to make clear to members um, that that is um, unvalidated data. Um, we have um, identified uh, uh, just a couple of issues really with the way that the um, service is collecting and reporting on some of this data. Um, so we're doing some data accuracy checking um, and uh, we can certainly make sure, again, working with Terry and his team um, to make sure that we can be confident uh, about the data that we've in, uh, including in, in future reports. Um, but just a, a, a warning that, that to correct in the minutes, really, I think, Louise, that that, 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 that data probably isn't accurate and, and is it's not, not validated data. Okay, well, thank you for bringing that to our attention, Sharon, because I'm sure we, would, we wouldn't have realised. So it's, it's good to see that you've, you've been honest to, to raise that point. So thank you. Well, you're welcome to, to leave, gents. Uh, thanks very much for your time. Can I just ask the eye in the sky if she needs me for the next item? <laughs> you're right for the next item, Jamela. Yeah, Jamela, are you? Oh, yes, sorry, I was muted then. Sorry, if you <clears> could <throat> stay, that would be really helpful, Steve. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, thank you. Do members need a quick uh, comfort break just uh, before we move on to this final item? Yes. Yeah. How long are we going to be chair? We're going to come final item. So it's a quick one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, should, we, should we have a five minute break? Five minutes. Yeah. So we, if we start again at 10 to.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're moving on to agenda item six, um, adult social care reform, cap on care. And um, I think Jamela is introducing this one. Uh, who, Jamela Hussein, Corporate Director of Adult Services and Integration, who's online. Hi, Jamela. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so this is a paper that uh, was asked by uh, members of this uh, committee to, to bring back uh, around the cap of care. I think when I originally uh, brought this paper, the cap of care was to come into being uh, in October um, 2023. This has been uh, delayed now. So from the, the top of the report, I have um, I have mentioned this to say that um, the reforms did start and commence again in 2021 to be implemented this October. However, um, late last year, uh, we were told by the government that the implementation date has since changed and the cap on care has been delayed till 2025. Just to give you a bit of background on what, how this has come about, so the, the Care Act 2014 actually has a section in there called Section 15, which um, contains the provisions to create a cap on care. Now, there are a lot of people who are saying, is this delay um, a, a, a guise for getting rid of the cap on care altogether because it may be too complicated. However, the Care Act 2014 actually puts it into statute. And then the white paper, People at the Heart of Care, that came out uh, last year and hopefully will um, be into more of a statute later on this year, also highlights the importance of having um, the, the, cap, the cap on care. So just a bit about what... Um, part of the reform the cap on what the cap on care means so the cap on care means that we will set that people will pay no more than 86000 um, pounds for their for their care costs so when they have spent that much that that will be their ceiling rate it also means um some pressure for for councils because a part of that cap on care actually suggests that at currently people become self-funders if they have savings over and above 23,250 or 23,500, then they become uh, eligible for support from the council. The cap on care looks at um, individuals who have £100,000 uh, or, or less, and they then become eligible for the social um, care to start assessing them and bringing them into the system around how we support and assess for care and making sure that the cap, cap on care is reasonable from that point. So it does actually put lots of pressures on the council. And one of the reasons I think for the delay was is that lo lots of councils that said additional assessments for all those people it will mean additional support staff. Social workers are quite, as you know, are quite difficult to actually recruit at the moment. And also it has an impact on our finance colleagues, so Steve, um, and how they then start to look at means testing all the additional people that will come in. York is has a high number of um, self-funders, around 70%. Uh, of our population would be self-funders at this moment in time. However, that will significantly reduce uh, once the cap on care will uh, come in place. So there's a whole in, uh, bit in the paper about implementing the new rules, which I'm not going to go in today because, because of the delay in the cap on care, this really does not, um, does not um, uh, mean anything at the moment because this was towards payments known as top ups and how the local authorities can actually set some top ups going forward. But until the cap on care it comes in place, we're we're not at that stage. Preparing for implementation, we're still preparing for implementation. We know the cap on care at the moment has been um, stated that it will come in 2025. So we do need to do an additional analysis on. Our data, we do need to look at what additional resource in terms of assessment resource and um, finance resource we will need. But equally, we will have to bring in a much more robust system of self-assessment on our website, which we haven't got at the moment. So there's lots of work that we need to do in readiness for 2025, notwithstanding our front facing uh, assessment, commissioning and additional uh, uh, financial modelling. 
there is no consultation required at this stage because there was a national consultation done um, when the when the cap on care came in place and also the national con consultation is ongoing around the, the white paper. So as I uh, said, the implications as the cap on care is delayed until 2025, the implications for us are, are low at the moment, but equally what we need to make sure is that we do not take our eye off, off the ball and make sure alongside the other reforms that are coming in around um, adult social care, we plan for these as well, because 2025 isn't too far. So I've just asked the members to uh, note this report. Um, if there's anything, um, Steve, you want to add from a finance uh, point of view or I don't know if Terry's gone or Terry from a um, performance bit. Terry's gone, but I suppose what needs to be noted is the funding that was going to pay for the loss of income to councils has been redirected to pay for the cost of care exercise, which we're currently going through. And also the health and social care levy that was going to pay for it has been reversed. So there's going to have to be a, a central government decision about how they would fund it if they do implement it in, the, in, the, in October 25. So significant challenges aren't there, the Steve, around, around this, and something that scrutiny may want to, to to keep an eye on. And as we as we see, if we see if any reforms or any changes coming through, um, without the additional resource, it's going to be quite difficult for um, York or any other council to manage the implementation. Thank you, Jim and Steve. Um, any questions, members? Councillor Vassy. Yeah, I, I, in a sense, it's been alluded to here, but um, it leaves me concerned about the potential scale of what we're talking about here. Are there, has the council done kind of rough modeling to get a sense of what we're talking about? Do we know, for example, we've got a figure here of a cap of 86,000 pounds. Are we able to say, well, the typical sum that is spent by someone in the last years of their life is X, therefore we're likely to see a demand of uh, X times the number of people in the city. Have we done any of that modelling to at least have a sense of what, what may hit us in now three years' time? So I'll come in Jamela. So there was national modelling done, and that was um, then done at the detail of the York. So York got its own report. Um, I forget the organisation that did it, that did some of that modelling in terms of what it would mean in terms of likely loss of income to the authority, but also to the bit that Jamela alluded to in terms of what additional staffing capacity we would need to do the assessments and everything. So we have got that report. I don't know the details behind it, but we certainly got the modelling around that as well. The other side of this is the cost of care. So we have done modelling around the cost of care, what it would mean if our rates go up to a certain value, which I can't disclose here because it's obviously commercially sensitive. But we have been doing some uh, modelling of that as we've gone through that process as well. It, it sounds like this is for next year or in the months ahead, but it sounds like it would be a value for the scrutiny committee to get to grips with these figures, however rough, so that we can understand what's staring us in the face in three years' time if this plan gets implemented. And of course, we can't know that for sure, uh, but plainly we need, to, we need to be ready as a local authority. Yeah, well, I guess ultimately, if it's delayed to 2025, which is, has been said, um, that will be post the general election. It's quite a possibility that there might be a change of government. Um, and um, it could be a whole change in, in plan, potentially. Um, but from, from what I see, the, there's something to be welcomed about a raise in some of the thresholds that I mentioned, um, once implemented at least. Um, I'm not sure what else I can ask at the moment. <laughs> so we're happy to bring something back. So we're happy to bring some modelling back maybe in, in six to eight months' time. Why I say that, uh, leading in town, Councillor Vassie, is, is that we are, as um, 
Steve mentioned doing our cost of care exercise with our care homes and domiciliary care agency. So if we do it now, we won't have an accurate picture. Once we've done that cost of care exercise, we'll get a real understanding. We know the numbers of self-funders we have in, in the area, but if we want to overlay that with the financial cost between the 86 and the rest, what the, the council will then um, support, we can bring that sort of maybe back in six to maybe eight months time. And then um, if the cost of care is is truly going to be implemented, we we'll probably need further discussions at scrutiny of how that's going to take place. Thank you, Jimena. Any, any final questions or comments on that, colleagues? No? Right, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, that leaves us with the, the work plan on the back, um, which in terms of this is our final um, scrutiny meeting ahead of uh, the, the election period. Um, the, uh, we can only put forward proposals for consideration in terms of what uh, scrutiny might want to look at in the future. Um, even if I... I'm luckily re-elected re -elected by the residents of Strensel. Uh, I wouldn't intend to be chair um, in, the, in the new municipal year. I think, you know, I've, I've done two ch terms myself um, and I think it's time for, for a new chair. I think it's, to pardon the pun, it's healthy to have a, a change now and again. Um, and I've, I've had my periods. So I'd like to thank officers and uh, members that I've worked with over the years because um, it's been um, probably, I think, well, for me, it's been certainly the most interesting of the committees we have at the council, but um, obviously it's the one I've been most closely involved with, so I would say that, but <coughs> nevertheless, um, it's something that affects us all and our, our residents and families, um, so it's something that's very close to my heart, so I've enjoyed it, and it's not all been good, some of it's um, been very challenging, um, but um, thank you, and thank you to officers. Um, obviously, we've got the um, list of proposed items for consideration there. In addition, um, I think from what we've discussed this evening, um, we'll be adding uh, a look at um, the CQC um, when they've looked at, you know, they come to look at the local authority, I think there'll be some kind of report to, to follow on from that that will need to be listed. Um, there's the ICB developments, which Sharon mentioned to me earlier on, um, which ought to be added. Um, and also, obviously, um, the cost of care exercise when that time comes. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that members can think of offhand at the moment that needs to be there just as a a guide for whoever um, is part of the new committee come May. Members content with that? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I don't have any other urgent business. It would seem appropriate, I think, just to, before we conclude, thank you as well for sharing uh, through uh, how many years, did you say? It's more than eight. I've been chair, but I've been, I've been on health scrutiny right yeah. from being a for joining as a councillor in 2011. So and I was with you as vice chair for a, a, yes. a while of that. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Thank you indeed. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you. Right, if uh, I, don't, as I, say, I don't have any other, any, uh, other business, so uh, unless anything any members want to raise, we'll call it a close.